I can see already I made a mistake. I started re trying to read my own writing, so it might take me a little while, but we'll get through it. The three, I'm picking three out of the many missionaries that we do support in Europe. Uh, all three of them are in the United Kingdom, one in Wales, and one, and two of them are in England. The first one I want to talk about, and do we have that going? Yeah. Give, us, give me the first slide, if you will. And these are one of our newest missionaries on the field. They're Jonathan and Gracie Heaton. They've been in England less than a year. And I could not find a picture of them, but what I read and was talking, they were talking about was the different events that they're having. They're very much involved with Crown College's um, ministry over in England and through that they are finding they are helping and they are actually dealing frequently with the gillets uh, which I didn't even know about at that time but they were talking about some of their their ministries that they're trying to go out and reach other people one of them is a ladies afternoon tea that they have annually another one is a spring national youth rally then they have something called a Spring Holiday Bible Club, which is very similar to our vacation Bible school that they have. That's been going on. And then they have a very large event, a Sunday school day and a parade. And the I didn't know this until recently, not, not by their letter, but Sunday school was actually um, thought of, developed, started in England in the 1800s. And they use that time to have a day. And as you can see here, they actually have a parade. And these are their, their um, day that they're having. Now, that is not them, him preaching, but they are meeting with other church groups as well. But they are doing very well. They do have a couple of prayer requests that we pray for individual people. And this is where my writing is not good. So pray for these people. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Just pray for the people. Oh, and one other thing that they are doing is they're subbing as a pastorate in another small town that is in need of a pastor. So that is our first missionary that I'm here to talk about. Our second one is Jonathan as well. Jonathan and Na Natalie. Natalie, thank you. <laughs> Names are terrible with me. Natalie Vanderhoek. Okay, and they are also in the United Kingdom in England, and they also are doing a pastorate in another town periodically because of the need for pastors is what I'm getting from these two letters that they do have. So their prayer request is they um, need a new build building. They had a building, it seated about 80, and the first Sunday they had 78 in there in there yes yeah, so they can grow by two <laughs> okay that they're going to need a new building so um pray for a lady named angie oh and they have a ministry that works with the ukraine and they this i can't pronounce the ministry but it's a local ministry and they were talking to one of the Ukrainian um, soldiers, uh, head of the soldiers, and they were requesting that they needed Bibles for their um, for their soldiers, basically. And locally, they had a, a group give them the necessary Bibles, and these are Bibles that they're giving to the soldiers in the Ukraine which I thought was a great idea. Um, they do have prayer requests for their family. Uh, one of them, their uncle died, and the other one has a need for his uncle's salvation. Okay, and that's Vanderhooks, and thank you. I forgot that. Do me one more slide. The last one is, not them there, B.J. Stagner. He's the gentleman on the far, on my far right, your far left. Okay, I'll put it that way. 
He has been there since 2000, I got to mark this around, 2014, and he's added it up, and he has, their group has given out over 500,000 tracts and the Gospel of John in their area. So that is his way of getting the message out. He's got two works, um, and don't ask me to pronounce him. <laughs> Please don't ask me. But they're in Wells, and one of the prayer requests that he had was he was seeing a increase in paganism, in uh, witchcraft, in whatever the paganism was. And I really liked his response about it because he looked back at the history of Wales, and there was an increase in paganism. I think it was in the 1800s. Don't quote, don't quote me on that. But it was right before a revival that took place in Wales, and he was really looking forward to God doing something special because of what is going on. And so keep that in prayer, if you will. And let me see if I can, uh, oh, their building is in need of repair. Pray for that as well. And I enjoyed this, not, not as good, and he's not paying me for this, but he's not as good as our pastor. But he does have his sermons on his website, and I listen to him. Very, very good. If you get a chance, it's called Help, M-I-N-U-K dot com. And he's got sermons that he has done. You will appreciate him. He's from Tennessee. I forgot to tell you that. So keep him in mind. And maybe that's why I like him. I don't know. But he's, he is enjoyable. Uh, I ended up talking to... <laughs> this was interesting. I, I, I've gotten such a blessing from dealing with these missionaries. I literally talked to his wife on the phone. Then I got my phone bill. <laughs> We're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> okay, they did. They reduced it. It was. It was not good. Let me just tell you that way. Okay, but all three of these, I just love. They look at the area that they're at, and they have different ways that they're doing their uh, ministry. That they're doing their outreach, and each of them have people that are in need. Again, I can't pronounce or read the names, but keep them in prayer. They have people that they've been talking to and praying for, but I just love seeing the different ways of evangelism that has been going on and the way that these missionaries have to think in their field what works best in their, in their area, and that's good. So, okay? All right. And uh, for those who are working with the missionaries, what you want to get is a little app called WhatsApp. It's free, and you can do it on your phone, you can do it on your computer, and you can call them just aud uh, audibly, or you can video chat with them. It's completely free, and you all need to have that. So, All right, let's take our Bibles, please, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, we're excited about our, our little break. It's been a while since I've been anywhere. And... Um, of course, that's true for everybody through COVID. But we're hoping, uh, what do you hear this? Uh, hopefully, hopefully on Sunday morning, we're going to be in NASA, Bahamas. And we're going to be visiting Su Susanna Flanders. She's not Susanna Flanders anymore. Her, her, her married name is uh, Knowles. And her, her husband, Cranston Knowles, is pastor of a church there, right in NASA. So I contacted her. I said, it's hard to get a taxi from the, you know, the harbor. Uh, to the church and she wrote back uh, just a lovely note and saying hey we are going to be your taxi so they're going to come pick us up and uh and so it's a black church right so i'm hoping they'll put me in the choir you know i just want to i think it's going to be great i think it's going to be fantastic i really do i think it's, it's you know when you go somewhere one of the one of the greatest blessings is to go to a church with god's people because i, mean, I remember in romania and i couldn't understand a word they were saying but the tunes were the same, you know, and it was just like coming home. And it's a fantastic, you know, the family of God is all over. And so anyway, we're looking forward to Sunday morning there uh, in NASA. Anyway, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want us to read our scriptures again tonight. Now, we started this last week and we're talking about ambassadors for Christ. And there were, now, this is the beginning of a little series on testimony and evangelism and our witness 
And so this is a, a very, very important passage of Scripture to the Apostle Paul as he, in 2 Corinthians, speaks about himself, speaks about his ministry, speaks about why he does stuff. Why does he go to the, the regions beyond? He shares his motivations. And so in verse 14, Paul says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And Lord, we are so thankful for our church tonight. It's wonderful just to come apart, to be with your people around your word, and to talk to you, Lord, to worship you. And Lord, to... Uh, listen to the scriptures and we pray that you'll guide our study tonight may it be meaningful and lord we know we've got a lot of young people in here and uh, sometimes that can be boring but lord i just pray that you'll encourage and help them to get something out of this as well because they're very very important and lord i pray that you'll use your word in our hearts tonight for we ask it in jesus name amen so this passage we break into three parts first of all we have the ambassador's motive and that's in verse 14 through verse 17 then we have the ambassador's ministry and that's verse 18 through verse 20 then the ambassador's message in verse 21 they we might get to that tonight might not might save that for next time because the ambassador's message is tremendous you know there's not a message like we have and it's contained in verse 21. That's the gospel in a nutshell. Now, just to, to recap a little bit from last week, we talked, we spent a, a good amount of time speaking about what was it that motivated the Apostle Paul. Now, we talked about the love that Paul had for Jesus. And he says the love of Christ. So really, that's the other way around. But the Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. If we don't love the Lord, we're really not going to serve the Lord. Do you think you're going to do what you're going to supposed to do as a Christian just, just because of uh, what the pastor thinks or what your, what your mother thinks or your father thinks or your friends think or your brothers and sisters in church think? Or, but just because it may be your responsibility. There will come a time of testing in all of our lives when the rubber meets the road. Why are we really doing it? And if we're not doing it because we love Christ, uh, that's, going to be, that's going to be exposed. But that is the most important motivation is to serve him because we love him. And that's the great commandment, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. But he's, he's made it easy for us because he's done those things that would cause us to fall in love with him. So he has captured our hearts and we want to do those things that please him. But, and so that's important. But we went on to say that when he talks about the love of Christ constrains us, it's, it's really defined by the last part of the verse because he says, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So all were dead in trespasses and sins, all needed a savior, and Jesus was the provision for that savior. And so what he's saying is, it's not that Paul loves the sinner in Lystra when they were stoning him, but the fact is that Jesus loved those people. And because Paul loved Jesus and because Jesus loved them, then he was willing to go to people he didn't know or people he didn't like or people who were going to harm him. He would go because of this relationship, not just because of that relationship. Because, and I have to say that most of the evangelism we do, people are very kind. People will listen. Uh, we, we, you know, you always tell these, you hear these war stories from preachers or so, and yeah, I went to the door and he was about to shoot me and all this. That's a very, very rare thing. Very, very rare. Most people are very, very open. Um, but even when they're not, we go because of Christ. And what that means is, if you look down at verse 16, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Before I got saved, I didn't care about a person's soul. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't care about my own soul. But once I got saved, and I realized that this is true for everybody else. We talked about that last time. And the fact is, when we look at people, the people we deal with um, are people who God loves, who Jesus died for, who have an eternal soul, who will spend eternity somewhere. And honestly, you cannot believe the Christian message and somehow that, that get past you. 
Everybody in your family is a soul that will spend eternity somewhere. Everybody on your street, your neighbors, the people you bump, in, bump into every day. It's important that we see them through spiritual eyes and really the fact that God loves them and wants them to be saved. And, you know, when we express that motive, when we express our motivation and, and witnessing, it's, it's, it's not a matter of like the Calvinist where he says, well, we go because we're commanded to go. Okay, now when you think about Jonah, remember Jonah? He was commanded to go, wasn't he? <laughs> Did he want to go? No. You know why? Because he didn't like the people. And you know what? If you're in his shoes, you wouldn't like the people ever either. They were the Assyrians. The Ninevites were the Assyrian people. They were the most ruthless people that ever walked the face of the earth. Did you know that the Assyrians, when, the, when they went into war, they would uh, capture a city. They would round all the men up. They would cut all their hands off. And they would, they would make a big pyramid out of their hands and, and maybe heads or something. They used, to, they used to flay them alive. That means they would take their skin off while they were still alive. They would take a person's skin and they would cover buildings with it. They would make buildings and incarcerate people inside and block it up and then cover it with the skin. Why did they do that? They were putting fear, the fear of the Assyrians into those people. They were very wicked people. And so God says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and say, yet 40 days and Nineveh should be overthrown. A judgment's coming, and Jonah says, I'm the way the other way. So Jonah disobeys the Lord, and he's on his way to Tarshish. And God has to get his attention. Can God get your attention? Oh, yes. And the storm came up. And, that, you know, the sailors fought hard to, to save the ship and save Jonah. And Jonah says, I'm the reason why this is happening. The best thing you can do is take me and throw me overboard. And so that's what they end up doing, throw him overboard into the water. And then the, the great face comes, swallows him up. And he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, right? Now, I would have been there about five minutes, and I'd have been surrendering, you know. I'd said, no, whatever, Lord. <laughs> but old Jonah is very, very stubborn. You know, the Bible calls the Jewish people stiff-necked, right? And they're very stubborn at times. But anyway, Jonah learned lesson number one. Number, number one lesson for Jonah was this. Jonah, when I tell you to do something, you do it. You know why? Because I'm God, and you're my creature, and you're my servant. And so Jonah got to the place where he says, he threw the hands up and he says, Lord, I surrender. If you tell me, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. And so I believe it was the morning uh, of the third day that he was vomited out of the face's belly and he started running and he went toward Nineveh. Now they say that he could have been bleached. People have got people out of whales' bellies and uh, they're all bleached, they're white and they didn't smell very good either. And uh, maybe when he got to Nineveh and they see this bleached white guy standing up. And by the way, he goes into the city a day's journey. And then he stands up and he simply says, Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So he says. Now let me ask you, do you think, oh, Jonah's out there crying and pleading with the people to repent and get saved? No. He was completely dispassionate. The only reason he was there was obedience to God. He didn't really care about them. He really didn't want them to repent. How do you know that? Because what happened was they did repent in sackcloth and ashes. And he saw it and he said, oh no, God is going to keep his word. He's not going to judge these people and I want them to be judged. And so he goes on through the city and he finds a little hill on the other side of the city and he sits down there in the heat of the day to see what would happen. And the Bible says God prepared a gourd, which is a plant, and it grows up overnight. And it created this little shelter for Jonah. And he was very glad of it because it, it sheltered him from the sun. And there he was sitting on the hillside waiting for God to change his mind and God to bring judgment. Maybe after the 40 days, maybe the, the people would have backslidden or whatever. And God would have brought the judgment anyway. And he's sitting there. And God has a conversation with Jonah. He says, Jonah, um, how's it going? Jonah says, okay. He says, do you think that it's right for you to be angry and for you to be vengeful when there's 120,000 soul, 120, souls in that city that don't know their left hand from their right? In other words, children, innocent ones. So here's what God does. He prepares a worm that destroys the plant. It came up in one night. It was destroyed in one night. And once that happened, old Jonah was really, really angry. He's really upset now. And God says, come here, Jonah, let's compare notes. You have more compassion on a plant than you do on this city of human beings and people. And do you think that's right? 
See here, the first lesson for Jonah was, Jonah, you do it because I tell you to do it. And that's where the Calvinist is at. The Calvinist thought, does he have passion? Does he have a burden? Well, if God is not passionate and God doesn't have a burden and God doesn't have tears over the non-elect, then why should he? And so he's not burdened. He's just doing it because it's his job to do it. But does that really explain the love and the passion of Christ? Does God not want us to have a heart in what we're doing? Does God not want us to share tears? Does God not want us emotionally to be involved? I think he does. You know why? Because he is. God is emotionally involved. And so the second lesson for Jonah is this. Jonah, I don't want you to go just because I tell you to go. I want you to go for the same reason why I'm sending you. So what was the re- why was the reason God was sending Jonah in the first place? It's because he loved the people. As wicked as they were, as violent as they were, as undeserving as they were, God still loved them anyway. And Jonah, I want you to have that in your heart. I want you to go and have compassion on these people. And when you preach, you're not just a matter of factly saying, yet 40 days and none of us shall be overthrown. I want you to have passion. I want you to occur. I want you to have tears. I I want you to rejoice when these sinners repent. Because I do. Do you think Jonah got the lesson? Well, who wrote the book? Jonah wrote the book. And that's the lesson of Jonah. The The first lesson, do it because I tell you to do it. But the second lesson is, Jonah, I want you to reflect who I am to these people. I want them to see the passion and the mercy and the compassion and the love. And in other words, people need to see that in you. And they need to see that in me. And so we've have, we have got to be very careful with our attitude. Now that can be difficult at times. I've said this before. When we started the church in Antrim in Northern Ireland, uh, I, we went door to door. Uh, in fact, Sharon and David were helpers just a little bit later on in the, in the work once it got started. But, but in the first year of the work, I'd be knocking on doors and nobody was interested. I knocked on the door one time and the lady came to the door. She says, what do you want? I says, I'm here to talk to you about the Lord and tell you about our church. She says, hold on just a wee minute. I'll get my husband. So she went away. She was like, go on 10 minutes. And he finally came in. I don't know if she told him or not, but he finally arrived at the door. He says, what do you want? I says, well, I'm from the church we're trying Get out of here. He says, I'm not interested in that. He slammed the door in my face. Now, that's one of the war stories. Very rarely does that happen, okay? I tell you, to tell you what my reaction was, I could feel it on my feet. It started coming up like this. I just wanted to grab the guy by the throat and strangle him. And I said, you know, I didn't think you would be interested. And I was just being snarky. And I knew that wasn't right. And I went down the garden path and I said to myself, Phyllis, you need to go home and get a cup of tea. Because you don't have a right attitude. Because when we're talking to people, even if they're rude to us, even if they're rejecting, by by the way, most people are not rude. And most people do not reject in the sense many people will listen to you. I just sold one of my my toys here today. I sold sold my motorcycle. And the guy that picked it up, actually he's from up in Bersheba Road. And uh, and he's getting a good deal. I'll tell you what, he's getting a good deal. But anyway, and I'm looking forward to seeing it run around here. Um, but anyway, after we'd done the deal and everything, I had the thing loaded up on this trailer and all. And I said, now, I want to talk to you for just a minute. And I just stopped him. And there was him and his wife and his son. His son was about 17 years old, 18, something like that. And, and I just had a little sermon right there. I said, I want to tell you something that's the most important thing. I said, because these motorcycles are dangerous. And I said, the most important thing I could tell you is what happens when you, when you leave this life. And so I gave them the gospel. And they said, after, and they listened very carefully. And then they said, uh, yes, we're saved. And uh, they said, we're not in church because there's a lot of problems in churches. I said, I know. Tell me, I'm a pastor. I know a little about it. Not our church, but in other churches. <laughs> Thank God we don't have any problem in our churches. You know, church can be the nearest thing to heaven or the nearest thing to hell, you know. Um, and I'm glad ours is the nearest thing to heaven. But anyway, but I got the witness. Of, I gave him some, some leaflets. And, uh, and by the way, I'm going to say this to you. It's really important, and I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, some of you are just like, you're quiet, right? You're quiet, and you just don't do this. You know, you're not extrovert, you don't, you're not able to stand up, okay, I'm going to preach to you now, that's never going to happen for you. And I understand that, and some of you, it's very, very difficult even to strike up a, converse, a spiritual conversation. And I'm telling you, God has given us tools, and you don't even have to say a whole lot. And so there's a couple of things that we have back there. Now, I have a, a booklet called The Anchors of Faith. And if you get somebody really interested, you need to get that and give it to them. Um, my, my niece was saved through reading Anchors of Faith. Um, I went to a church in Virginia one, uh, one furlough. 
and I, I sold them for a dollar a piece, right? And so uh, this, this guy bought several. I went away to Ireland, came back four years later. He says, I want to talk to you. He says, remember you were here last time you had your selling anchors of faith? I said, yes. He said, I bought some of them. And I had a doctor friend in Dallas, Texas. And he was living in Virginia Beach. A, a doctor friend, a lady doctor friend in uh, Dallas, Texas. And he said she was an atheist. And I wanted her to read this. Um, but I knew if I, if I sent it for her to read, she will throw it in the bin or she wouldn't read it. So we had a mutual friend and I sent it to her to tell her to give it to our mutual friend so that he would read it, knowing that she would read it out of curiosity. And she did lift it and she did read it. And you know what happened? She got saved. And he was so excited. I was excited about it. So there's, there's tools that you can use. Okay, but that's maybe for somebody who's maybe interested in it. Okay, um, okay so we have these little, these little leaves. They're dead small. I'll tell you what I do with them. I put them in here. Now you can't, you know, look at that there. Uh, full of plastic. But anyway, I put them in there like that. And you see it fits right in there like that. Because, you know, sometimes you don't have tracks on you. But if you have two of those in there, that's all it takes. And then you're meeting somebody and say, you know what? I'm going to this wee church over here. They don't have a proper church building. But you know what? They're trying hard. And here's a little leaflet. And you open it up. It's, it says, uh, everyone needs a home. And then on the inside, it talks about Calvary Baptist Church, and they've got this little yellow stain on some of them. I'm going to have to send them back. But anyway, um, it's got the plan of salvation. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, you can know for sure you have a home in heaven. It's talking about a home. Um, then it's talking about the service times, the time to meet with your family, your church family. Uh, new building plan, the home for the future. So a little, little uh, blurb about that. Um, and then details about the services and so on. Times of services are all in there and all that. It's dead easy. To take that and say, let me, just, let me just share that with you. And, you know, at that point you can kind of discern, is this going to open up their conversation or is it not? And sometimes it will actually open up where you get to talk to people. Another thing you can do, um, beside that one, is just, and this is even smaller, it's just a little card. Okay, and they've got, hey, we're, getting, we're, we're uptown now, we've got these, what do you call these little code things? Q QR code or something, right? So you put your phone on that. And it, it just reads it, and then all of a sudden it opens up our church website, which has got everything in there. And it's got that on there, information about it, some verses on there. It's got the times of services on the back. It's got a little place to put a note, okay? If you're, gonna, if you're visiting someone and they're not there, you'd leave a little note on that. Just give them one of those. I'll tell you what, what, what everybody loves is this one here. Did you get your million dollars yet? Yeah. <laughs> it's a million dollar bill, right? And I tell people, don't try to, step, don't try to spend that, because they'll put you in jail. Yeah. All right? Um, but I, I take these, right, and fold it up like this. See, like that? And I'll stick it in when I'm pumping my gas, and I'll, I'll slide it into the crease in the pump. And people are going to come up, and they're going, what is that? And I, I guarantee you, they're gonna, the first person after me is going to lift it, because I think it's $100 or something. And then and it's, it's kind of uh, cryptic, because it's got, like, verses and stuff on it. But then it, do, it does have the plan of salvation on the back. But you see, you know what that is? It's an icebreaker. When we were doing the fair, that's what I I'd just go to people, you get your $100. And they start laughing, you know, and they'll take it off you. And then I'd say, you know, don't try to spend that because they're going to put you in jail. But I'll tell you what that, on the back of that, it, it gives you the most important, the most valuable lesson in the whole world. Yeah. And it's about going to heaven, you know. And so, again, what you're doing is you're reading. Is this person kind of laughing? Is he open? Is he stopping? Is he pausing to listen? And then open it up. Now, we're going to talk about the message later on because an ambassador needs to know his message. Uh, but when you do know the message very clearly, you can present it very quickly and get the point across. And it's so very important. Now, what I'm saying is, you might be quiet. And man, you just, I mean, it's like, it's like going to the dentist to, to do stuff like this. But if you get into the way of doing it, even if you don't talk, put those in the, uh, in the, the, the gas pump. You know, that's a start, right? That's a start. And then when you're talking to people, just, you know, that's a, that's a lovely little track, I think. And uh, on the front, it just says everyone needs a home and there's a front door. If you turn it around, it says Calvary Baptist Church, a church you can call home. It's got a little picture on there and stuff. It's very, it's non-confrontational, you know. But it gets you in the door and it gets you started. And because henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Every person that we come in contact with is a potential person to the witness to you, it's a, it's a soul for whom Christ died. And so, just like Jonah, the motivation is really important, that it's the love of Christ that constrains us to do it. Jesus loves them. 
You may not love him, but he loves them. And he wants them to hear the gospel. And we're his ambassadors. We go with his message. We represent him. That's why we're here. You know, we're going to the Bahamas. Could you imagine the ambassador from the United States? And he's in the American embassy in Nassau, Bahamas. And there he is. And he's out every day on the beach. You know, with his pink lemonade and the parasol. And he's enjoying himself laying on the beach. That's not why he's there, you know. He's there to represent America. He's there to, to speak for his president. He's not there to do his own thing. And yet when we think about our lives, we're really, a lot of times we're doing our thing. And we're not really representing and speaking for the Lord the way that we should. So motivation is really important. Why do you do it? Because you have to. It's not going gonna, gonna to last. Because people are looking at you. No, it's because of him. It's because, because, and I'm going to tell you something. See, a lot of this stuff here, you wouldn't do for me. And I don't blame you. I wouldn't do it for you either. Because sometimes you may get, a, 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 you may get rejected. Sometimes you may get embarrassed. You know what? Jesus was rejected for me. Jesus was embarrassed for me. Jesus was punched for me. Jesus was slapped for me. It's no big deal if it comes this way. But you know why I would do it? You know why I would do that? Because of him. I wouldn't do it for a preacher. I wouldn't do it for a church. I would do it for Jesus because he did it for me. And there's things that you wouldn't do for this church or you wouldn't do for the pastor or your, your friends or your family. But you would do it for Jesus. And that's basically what I'm saying. All of us should have that motivation. All right. The second thing then, motivation, ambassador's motive. Second thing is the ambassador's ministry. Okay. So let's go through. I'm not going to. I won't tell you what I was going to say. I won't be long tonight. But look at verse, look at verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now reconciliation, you see, in Luke chapter 14, it talks about the king going forth to war. He sits down and counts the cost, whether he with 10,000 can meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Else, while the other's a great way off, he sends an ambassador and seeks conditions of peace. Right? He's smart. I'm going to get beat. So I send an ambassador, he comes out with a white flag. Oh, what can we do to, we don't want to fight you and you don't want to fight us. And what can we do to make this? And there's conditions of peace that are drawn up. Well, it's usually the underdog that sends out the ambassador, but not so with the Bible. God is not the underdog, but because he loves us, he is the one that sends out the ambassadors with conditions of peace. And the conditions of peace is the gospel. Now, God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. It's not, you're not reconciled to God by his church. That's not what it says. It's, you're not reconciled to God by what you do, your good works. That's not what it says. It says that we're reconciled to God by Jesus Christ. The Bible is, and I, you know, I'm like a broken record around here because over and over and over again, we're saying that salvation is in a person that's in Jesus Christ. And so he's reconciled us to himself. In other words, we're saved. We're at peace with God. We have received the conditions of peace. We're at peace with God. And then it says uh, in verse 18, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So we've been reconciled to God. And then the very next thing, God then turns around to us and he says, okay, now you're a minister of reconciliation. In other words, we've been reconciled to God. So now God sends us out to be reconcilers as ambassadors with conditions of peace. I mean, that's what it says. Verse 19, to wit, which means to witness uh, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Okay, who does God want to save? The elect? The, the world? The world of the elect? No, the world. In verse 14, he says, one died for all. That's not all the elect. You, don't, you can't qualify scripture like that. You can't do that. When it says all, it means all. When it says the world, it means the world. And so his, his intention and his desire and his provision is for the world to be reconciled to, to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, what I want to say about that is this. First of all, who are the reconcilers? Who are the ones are, who are uh, to be reconcilers? Well, it's, it's us in verse 18, us, verse 19, us, verse 20, we. See, here's the deal. Most Christians think um, that, you know, being a witness, um, to be like preaching or, you know, Jesus said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, but that's not, that's not just the preacher's. 
We're all preachers. We're all ministers of reconciliation. I mean, that's what it says there. It says us, we, those who have been reconciled. We have been reconciled to Christ and now we have been committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Look over to Ephesians chapter 4 for just a moment. In Ephesians chapter 4. And here's why that's important. If you're just dependent upon the missionaries or the evangelist or the pastor or the youth pastor um, to, win, you know, to win people to the Lord, um, it's going to be slim pickings. Now, the pastor should be an example, and all a missionary should be an example, and he's got the opportunity, he should be doing something. Some missionaries are working in a very difficult place, and it's hard to get people saved, but at least he should be trying, right? But here's the point, is, does God just expect the pastors to be the evangelists, to be the, 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 the ministers of reconciliation? In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, look please at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets. Okay, now those are foundational gifts. If you go over to chapter 2 um, and the verse number 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the, the chief cornerstone. Well, do we have apostles and prophets today? Well, that's foundational. If God is building a building and he puts the foundation in first, you know, you don't come up to this level. When we're building this building, we didn't get up to, the, up to here and say, right, we need to bring the concrete truck in and put our, our foundation in up here. No, the foundation's already been in. You're building on the foundation, right? So the apostles and prophets are foundational for the first century. But then it says, and some pastors and some evangelists, and, uh, or sorry, uh, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Then it says in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, there's two ways you can read that verse 12. That the pastors and evangelists and teachers are given to do three things. Number one, they're to perfect the saints. Number two, they're to do the work of the ministry, which could be the ministry of reconciliation. Number three, they're to edify the body of Christ. That's why we have pastors. That's why we pay you, pastor. You're supposed to do all that stuff. You're supposed to be the evangelist. You're supposed to go out and witness. But is that what it's saying? Because in verse 12, you notice there's three words for. You see, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the... You got that? There's three words for. Did you know that the first word for is different than the last two words for? Mm -hmm. The last two words for is unto. The last two words are the same, but the first word is different. In other words, you could read it more accurately like this. That the pastors and teachers and evangelists are giving for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of the ministry, unto the edifying of the body of Christ. In other words, it's the pastor's job and the teacher's job and the evangelist's job to equip you. The word perfect means if, you, if a ship is going to sea, you put everything in it. That you need, like we're going on a cruise tomorrow, right? First bag has not been packed yet. So when we get home tonight, we're going to be equipping for the voyage. <laughs> And we're going to probably forget something. But the idea is you're going to put everything that you need in the boat. So that when you get out to sea, you've got everything you need. That's the word perfect. It means to equip. It means to fit you out. In other words, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelist's job is to give you everything that you need. So that you can do two things. The work of the ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. So I think the work of the ministry actually is the ministry of reconciliation. Could be other things too. But he talks about the edification of the body of Christ. Well, let me ask you, who, who's to edify the body of Christ? Well, that's the pastor's job, right? Well, maybe. But if you look down at verse 16, the last part, it says, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Who's to edify the body of Christ? The body of Christ does. If you're waiting for the pastor, and the pastor should be edifying, but his real job is to give you everything that you need so that you can do the edifying. You know, if you have to wait tonight until I go around every single one of you and talk to you for 10 minutes before you go home, we're going to be here a long time. You know, I get to talk to a few people, you know. And by the way, um, I'll just throw this in. On Sunday mornings particularly, you know, we've got two doors. And over this door, I stand and I greet people on the way out. Now, usually I'm after maybe visitors or if there's any unsaved people. If I sense they're unsaved, 
I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them right there and then at the door. I'm going to say, it's great to see you here today. Let me ask this one. Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Someone will say yes. Someone will say no. I said, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'll maybe give them something before they head out. I want to catch them at the door. Now, let me just say something. <laughs> and I love you as well. And I want to spend as much time as I can with you. But if I'm standing at the door trying to catch people on the way out, don't come to me in that first five minutes and say, Pastor, I want to talk to you about something. If you, you know, if, a, 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 you know, if you want to talk to the pastor about something, man, I'll, I'll, I'll stay all afternoon to talk to you. But when they're, they're, they're going to be going out that door, I've got to be there with a net trying to catch them. Yeah. And if you're out there talking to me, and I love you and I want to talk to you, but I'm on a mission. And so, and, and I hope, you, I hope and I've probably done this, but I hope you, I, I haven't offended you. I, you know, you're, you're talking to me in one ear and I'm, I'm greeting hands, shaking hands. Hello, hello, glad, yeah, 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 glad, hello, glad you came today. Hello, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can't do that, right? So just wait until after they've all gone, then I'll talk to you as much as you want. But what I'm saying is, when we edify the body of Christ ourselves, basically you're going to be talking to you and you're going to be talking to you and I'm going to be talking to somebody. And the conversation, and that's a good thing for a church to be sitting here, you know, 20 minutes after the service and everybody's still talking to each other. That's a good thing. Yeah. Because that's part of what you're supposed to be doing. Edify means to encourage. It means to build up. And we do that through relationship. And so if you're waiting for me, if it's just me and you, it's going to get pretty tiresome. But that's not the plan. The plan is that we're to do it like web relationships, you see. It's like a body. Uh, the body holds on to the body. Okay. So if it's the responsibility of the body to identify itself, it's also the responsibility of the body to do the, the, the work of the ministry. And it's the preacher's job to equip you with the tools to be able to do that. And that's what, one of the reasons why we're doing this little series, because, and I know it's a tough nut to crack, because we are what we are, and we're probably not going to change very readily. But if you can see, maybe through this series, or through the scripture even tonight, that God wants you to do this. It's not Brother Tom wants me to do it. Jesus wants you to do this and Jesus is going to bring somebody across your path and he's going to touch you in your heart and say, say something to this guy. Say something to this girl. And you have no idea what, they've been going through torment in their mind for weeks. They've been crying out to God for answers and God brings them by your path and all you have to say, hey, did you get your million dollars yet? And all of a sudden, you've opened the door to a conversation that not very many people have. When was the last time somebody witnessed to you? When was the last time somebody came up to you and said, hey, let me ask you a question. If you died tonight, would you, do you know for sure you go to heaven? When was the last time somebody asked you that? I'm going to tell you something. I can't remember the last time. Do you know why? Because it doesn't happen. That means the people you're talking to, it doesn't happen to them either. And people are dying. People are, have questions. People are broken and hurting. And you have the gold. You have the answer. In the gospel, you have the conditions of peace. You're an ambassador. It's your job to seek for those opportunities to, to talk to them so that they can be reconciled to God. You know, that's what missionaries do. I mean, missionaries go out and build hospitals and feed the poor and clothe them. And we're sending money over to Bulgaria to help with the Ukrainian refugees. And that's, you know, that's money to buy food and stuff that they need. You know, that's okay, but that's just the first step. That's to open up the door so that they can go in and they've got a, a meaningful relationship with that person and they're able to share Christ with that person. And so the, the ministry that we have is seeing people reconciled to God. And who has it? Every believer. I really, honestly, it's all of us. You know, Spurgeon once said, he says, the reason we have such a successful ministry at the Metropolitan Church in London is because our people bring the people. Spurgeon didn't do it. Now he was one of the best preachers ever ever was. Tremendous ministry. They would, they would write his sermons out, put them in the in the London newspapers. But I'll tell you something else, another wee secret that I've learned. If you just invite people to come to church without you witnessing to them, you've left it all up to me to do. And uh, and sometimes it's very, very difficult. You get somebody in here, they're not really prepared to come because you've invited them. And I've got to do all the work to try to get the gospel clear and plain to them and woo them and try to win them to the Lord. Do you know what the secret is, really? When I got, when I, I got saved the first night I went to the Baptist church, 
But I had been witnessed to by two guys in work as a diesel mechanic. Two guys witnessed to me for at least six weeks before I went. And when I went and, he, and the guy from Alaska preached, the, re, the work was already done. And right in the invitation, I didn't know what an invitation, I didn't know anything about coming forward, but in my seat, and she was there, she asked me, she said, she said, we're talking about this this week. I love having Sharon here because she helps me remember things I've forgotten. But, and uh, the pastor said, if you're not saved, put your hand up. I didn't put my hand up. And she's looking around. She shouldn't have been. Why were you looking around? You have to know her. She's looking around. And she said, she saw I didn't have my hand up. She says, she says, why didn't you put your hand up? Sure, you're not a Christian. And I said, Sharon, I am a Christian. I just became a Christian. And I started crying. But you see, it was because other guys had put the work in. You know, Jesus said that the disciples in John 4, he says, other men labored, and you've entered into their labors, right? So what I'm saying is, I mean, if you will witness the people, and I know it's hard, but at least try. Ask God for opportunities. And part of that opportunity is inviting them to the church. But try to witness to them before they get here. Lay some groundwork so it'll make my work a little easier. And then maybe we can see some, some more fruit coming, you know, because they're ripe, they're ready by the time they get here, okay? So that's, uh, that's an important thing as well. Well, I'm going to stop here. The next thing we're going to talk about is the message in verse 21, which is fantastic. But you know what? The Bible says, as believers, we are ambassadors for Christ. We have the conditions of peace. And actually, just as a, a, a parting shot here in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, you see where it says in verse 20, or sorry, verse 19, uh, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Do you see the word commit there? That's a very important word. Commitment is like a, it's, 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 what they, it's the idea of stewardship. If I give something to Billy and I commit it to him, it's a responsibility for him to do maybe. Um, the idea is that he has to report for that. In other words, it's not I give it to him and it's forgot about. When I give it to him, it's a commitment to him. It's a stewardship. It doesn't belong to him, but I give it to him to, to do. Um, then at some point in the future, I'm going to come back to Billy and say, well, what happened? And that's really what God's doing with us. He's, he's coming to us the word of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. And one day, as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord Jesus is going to look at you and he's going to say, okay, well, how did it go? And being an ambassador... I gave you the truth of the gospel, the gold. We, are, we have this treasure in earth and vessels. We're nothing. We're dirt. We're a clay pot. But we have the treasure. And he said, you know, what did you do with the treasure? Did you share it around? Did you tell people about me? Did you, did you go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Did you, did you do what I told you to do? And some of us are going to say, well, Lord, I, I, I did my best. I wasn't very good at it, but I tried. God loves a good trier. But you know, if we stand there and we have kept our mouths closed our whole life and never once attempted because it was uncomfortable, because we didn't like doing it, I'm telling you, he's going to require of us what we did with that commitment. And I'm warning you now, I'm telling you now because it's in the book and we're going to have to give an account of what we've done in this life as far as sharing the gospel. So I'm going to just be up front with you. It's not something you can run away from. We'd like to, but one day we're going to stand before Jesus and that's really going to be the main thing because why? Because we are ambassadors. What does an ambassador do? He's over there in a foreign country giving the message of his king and that's what we're here for. If we're landing out on the beach with our pink lemonades when we're supposed to be doing what we're supposed to be doing, then it's going to be bad news for us at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we don't lose our salvation, obviously, but it has to do with reward. And we do want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And honestly, the, the, most, the most wonderful thing in the Christian life, other than being saved yourself, is being involved somehow in somebody else's salvation. Amen. You know, it's brilliant. And you know what? You might not be the person at the front leading the person to the Lord. You may have been the person that invited them here. Or you may have the person give them a little track or just encourage them or just being that good Christian witness to them that got their attention, that drew them this way. And you see that person get saved. There's nothing like it in the whole world. That's, an, that's eternal fruit. Men gather wages unto eternal life, Jesus said, John chapter 4. So anyway, we are ambassadors. We're to be motivated by his love for people. We might not love them, but he loves them. And he wants us to love them, just like Jonah. He wanted Jonah to love them. And we, he wants us to reflect who he is 
I mean, that's how we do the ministry. He says, we pray you in Christ's stead. You know, Jesus was your substitute on the cross. And now we're his substitute in the world. And so we should do it the way he would do it if he was here. I don't think Jesus would be a knucklehead, do you? Do you know any knuckleheads? Sometimes I can be a knucklehead. I don't think Jesus would be a knucklehead. I think he'd be very tactful, very kind, very loving. He would do it the right way. And he wants us to do that as well. So, have the right motivation, the love of Christ. And then understand the ministry that we have. It's been committed to us. The ministry of reconciling a sinful person to a holy God through salvation in Jesus. Getting people to be at peace with God through Christ. Salvation. It's really important. And really it's the most important thing. Father, we pray that you'd help us to be a witness for you. Lord, I know that's very difficult for many people in here because it's just that not their natural personality to be out there and to be gregarious and, and uh, maybe confrontational with people. But Lord, there's, there's, there has to be a way for all of us to be obedient to this calling. And we might be able to use literature, may not have to even say anything, maybe just hang tracks on doors or leave tracks around or uh, then begin to maybe use tracks to open up conversations. But help us, Lord. We want to be obedient. And Lord, we, we desperately want to see other people to know the truth and to be saved. And so help us, Lord, to be moved by your love and understand the responsibility and the ministry you've given to us. We, th we thank you, Lord. We ask for your help in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Let's sing